today. I hope you're ready for a great time in the Bible. Oh, yeah. Open up your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 7. Oh, yeah. Hebrews chapter 7. You know, I'm so very grateful to get the opportunity this morning to preach and to share some things uh, I was reminded of earlier this week in my quiet time. You know, it's good to have a quiet time uh, in the morning, is it not? You know, I've been reading the book of Hebrews for my quiet times lately, and uh, they've been really impactful and helpful. Now, you know, having been a Christian for 25 years, I've read through the book of Hebrews a few times in my day. And Brandon, my day has been a long time. So. But the fact is, is that uh, God always takes us to times and places. He knows what we need in our hearts. And I came across this scripture that really blew me away. So I, I had an amazing quiet time. I'm off on Monday, so I can spend a little more time in the Bible than I normally do. Oh, yeah. And I had a cranking time. Afterwards, I called Tyler. I was like, Tyler, what you doing? And we talked for a few minutes. I'm like, hey, uh, what you got planned for this Sunday? And he's like, oh, I don't know yet. I haven't even thought about it. I'm like, uh, can I preach? <laughs> I just had a really good quiet time. I'm ready, bro. Let me loose. Come on, bro. <laughs> I know you're done with James, and, and, and you know when you finish the series, it, your mind kind of wanders. So I'm ready, bro. Let me throw me in. I'm wandering, bro. Do <laughs> that. <laughs> so he said, all right, bro, that'd be great. I'll, I'll, what are you going to think about? I'm like, well, I'll tell you later. <laughs> Sunday. You can hear it with everybody else. <laughs> So we read this scripture in Hebrews chapter 7, starting in verse 14. Come on. It says, For it is clear that our Lord descended from Judah, in regard to that tribe Moses said nothing about priests. And what we have said is even more clear if another priest like Melchizedek appears, one who has become a priest not on the basis of a regulation as to his ancestry, but on the basis of the power of an indestructible life. Wow. For it is clear, declared, you are a priest in the order of Melchizedek. You know, it's saying here, he's talking, the book of Hebrews is written to the Israelite disciples at the time. Oh, and they understood that the high priest at the time always came from the line of Levi, one of the tribes of, of Israel. And yet, Jesus didn't come from that tribe. So how could he be a high priest? And so he references this guy named Melchizedek, who Abraham had met a long time ago, wasn't even an Israelite, and yet uh, Abraham bowed down and worshipped and gave a contribution to Melchizedek yeah. as the priest. Yeah. And so what the author of Hebrews is saying here is that Jesus is like Melchizedek. He doesn't come from the regular line of priests, but he's a priest because of the power of an indestructible wow. life. Wow. Whoa. I don't know about you. When I read that, I thought, oh, I want an indestructible life. Wow. And, I, and I think to myself, like, wow, what's it going to take to have an indestructible life? Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that's the question you have for yourself too, right? Yeah. How do I get an indestructible life? Well, you're in luck. I'm going to tell you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And really, when we think about this, I want you to think about Jesus. All of his life, what was Satan trying to do to him? Destroy him. Right? From the very beginning, we, th we picture Jesus. Here pretty soon, we're going to be celebrating Jesus in a manger. Right? Little baby Jesus, so cute, and everything's awesome. Well, think about it. He was born in a barn. Okay? So he didn't have the best of beginnings in life. And not only was he born in a barn, but the king of the land at that time was trying to kill him. His family, this Israelite family, had to move back to Egypt. Now, if you know a little bit of your history, you know there was a guy named Moses that brought the Israelites out of Egypt. And were the Egyptians happy about that? No. In fact, ever since that time, the Egyptians and the Israelites were kind of at war and kind of at an animosity to each other. Once in a while, they'd be friends and stuff like that. So here we got this little baby Jesus and his family moving back to Egypt. He moved to a neighborhood where nobody liked him. Nobody liked their family. Nobody was going to take care of them. They probably lived as nobodies in the land. See, that was Satan's way of trying to say, you're a nobody. You're nothing. Discriminated against. Right? Have you ever been discriminated against? I know some of us have been. It's horrible. It hurts deep. And that's how Jesus began his life. In the area where he was born, thousands of baby boys were killed because Herod was trying to kill the Messiah. Trying to kill Jesus. So right from the beginning of his life, 
Jesus was under attack from Satan. Wow. Trying to destroy him. Come on, bro. He comes back, grows up, goes, go, go, gets ready for his ministry. And what happens? Satan begins to tempt him right from the stars. Right? Yeah. Say, hey, bow down to me instead, and I'll give you everything. Yeah. Trying to destroy his ministry before it even began. Yeah. Come on. Jesus, for Thanksgiving, decides to go back and visit his family. His hometown. He starts hanging out with the family. They're having a great Thanksgiving meal. Yeah. He starts talking about liking the Detroit Lions versus the Dallas Cowboys. Oh. Sin in the camp. What's the whole city try to do? Throw them off a cliff. Wow. That's what happens when you don't like the Cowboys, right? Right, Ernesto? No, but... Jesus starts preaching, and everybody at first is like, oh, isn't this uh, Joseph and Mary's son? Oh, so good to have him back. What's he preaching about? Kill that dude! Why? Because Satan's trying to kill him. Right? From the very beginning. And then on the cross. Jesus is on the cross and dies. Because Satan is just trying to destroy him. Yet despite all these attempts, Jesus lived an indestructible life. And we can make it to heaven because of the power of that life. Wow. We know that only by God's grace cool. are we going to make it to heaven, right? Fine. Right? Does anybody here think they're good enough to make it there on their own? <laughs> and yet we can be fooled by that idea. We know that the only way we can make it to heaven is by God's grace and Jesus' indestructible life. So we can just take it easy, party, relax. Just make sure we go to church on Sunday, but otherwise we're good. Because of Jesus, right? No, this morning I've entitled my lesson, An Indestructible Life. And I want to talk about three keys for us to live the same indestructible life that Jesus lived. Turn over to 1 John chapter 2. We have to look at one scripture before I really jump in, though. Uh-oh, just one. 1 John chapter 2. An indestructible life. We've got to rely on Jesus and His indestructible life, but we too have to have an indestructible life. Mm. In 1 John chapter 2, we read this starting in verse 5. But if anyone obeys His word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in Him. Whoever claims to live in Him must live as Jesus did. Wow. There it is. Now, I don't know about you, but that word must means not optional in my dictionary, right? So we can say, well, I believe in Jesus. And I don't know about you, how many times have you talked to someone and said, well, I believe in Jesus. I'm okay. It's all good. And, and they think that's good enough. Wow. See, that's one of the ways that Satan tries to destroy us. Yep. To get us believe falsely. Yeah. Wow. Oh, you can believe in Jesus all you want. Just don't live like him. Ooh. Right? And yet we see here through the scripture that it's not optional. We're going to make it to heaven not because we're so awesome, that we're so great, but because of Jesus. And yet to live and make it to heaven, we've got to also live that indestructible life. Yes. We've got to live as Jesus lives. Yeah. We've got to have that powerful life as well. And you know what? Having an indestructible life is actually quite simple. Look over in Matthew, chapter 22. It's really simple to have an indestructible life. Turn over to Matthew, chapter 22, starting in verse 34. Come on, bro. So I'm not only going to challenge you, but I'm also going to encourage you today. Come on, bro. In Matthew, chapter 22, verse 34, and I hope you guys are ready to change your, uh, flip your Bible today, because we're going to go through a few scriptures. Come on, Come on, bro. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your minds. Yeah. Simple. To have an indestructible life, you need to do three things. Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Simple, right? You're all doing it already, right? See, it's simple, but it sure isn't easy. It sure isn't easy. So I've got three points for you today. 
You've got to have an indestructible heart. You've got to have an indestructible soul. And you've got to have an indestructible mind. So let's look at some of these scriptures. Colossians chapter 3. My first point. An indestructible heart. Colossians chapter 3. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, we read this. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. You guys with me? Oh, yeah. yeah. You guys there already? Yeah. Yeah. I've got a new Bible, so my pages all still kind of stick together. <laughs> so that'll give you guys a little extra time to share. Yeah. Yeah. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 says this. Since then, you've been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. How do you have an indestructible heart? You set your heart on things above. Okay. Mm. You set your heart on heaven Amen. in being with Jesus in heaven. Wow. Easy, simple, right? <laughs> no, it's not easy. No. Because I don't know about you, but every morning I get up, Satan has a way of really going after my heart. Yeah. First of all, that alarm clock. Yeah. You know, recently we, we have the pleasure of having Hector and Taylor move into our house. Oh. That's awesome. Hector works at Starbucks, yeah. so he has to be at work at 4.30. Oh, so I sleep in this room, and Hector and Taylor sleep in this room. I sleep on this side of the bed, I think Hector sleeps on this side of the bed. Because every morning at 4.15, I hear his alarm going off. God's like, isn't this heart stuff really good? Really simple. No, like every day Satan goes after our hearts. He knows the things that we want to put our emotions in. Yeah. Yeah. The word in the Hebrew is lev. L-E-V. Lev. And what it meant was not the organ. Sometimes we think about the heart. Like, how does my heart have to do that? How do I love yeah. God with my the organ? Boom, 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 boom. You know, I don't know. <laughs> but really they understood that the, the lev or the heart of a being was your emotions. Wow. It's the emotions of a person. You know, so many things can pull on our emotions. When I, I, I'm a, I love sports. I love watching Come sports. On. You know? and, and when I was a young boy, I was a Los Angeles Rams fan. Ooh. And I love the Rams. And I would, I would wear their jersey. I have a football helmet. I, I love watching their games. And every year they would lose in the playoffs to the stinking Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> I don't care if they all win or lose or die or whatever. But the idea is that, you know, emotionally I get involved in the games. But well, one year, the Rams beat the Cowboys to make it to the Super Bowl. Man, I was so excited. My team is in the Super Bowl. And they played the Pittsburgh Steelers and got killed. I sat on the fireplace and cried. I cried. And cried, and my mom is like, "What are you doing?" But you don't understand, my team lost, and I just cried. I probably should have confessed that all you guys. You guys have been Oh yeah, bro. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, the 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 is, memes. Are I didn't like, cry for like a minute or two minutes. I cried for like 30 minutes, 45 minutes, and for a 12-year-old kid, that's a long time to cry. <laughs> You know, usually a 12 year old, you're thinking about something else five minutes later. Not me. My heart, my emotions were so involved in watching that football team. You know, after that year, I never really liked the Los Angeles Rams again. <laughs> and I, I just, they broke my heart. Now, I know most of you probably don't feel that way about sports or whatever. That's fine. But there's things that come into our life that grab us in the heart. Yeah. Right? That they just. A heart, and I'm, you know, I'm 53 years old now, and I'm at a point in my life when I should be making more money than I've made before. I should be at a time in my life where I should own a house. I don't. We've just had to have the, these guys move in with us to help us because we're at a time where we're not making a whole bunch of money. My wife is about to, to start student teaching and not work at all, and so we're financially, we really need help. Cool. And so, okay, yeah, that sounds great as a 53-year-old and a 50. Some year old woman. Come on, Jay. You know it. I'm taking out the 
out and just giving away everybody's seats. Yeah. You know, it's really tempting to want what people want in this world. Yeah. Yeah. I want to buy a house. Yeah. I want to call something my own. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, that's loving things of the world. So I'm going to go pray. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go on a prayer walk in five houses down. That house is for sale. Oh. I, mean, I, I keep walking. Oh, there's another house for sale. Oh, and I keep walking. Out down. There's another house for sale. There's like six houses for sale on my normal prayer walk. Yeah. I'm like, God. I get home, I'm like, man, this prayer didn't help me at all. Because <laughs> my heart is still like, I'm just, I'm just thinking, that, that house has a pool. <laughs> Those people, maybe I can go see what the house looks like. Maybe they'll let me walk yeah, along real, back bro. and see the pool. <laughs> yeah. I'm just being real with you guys. Yeah. Yeah. So this morning I got up and I thought, you know what, I, I need to go and just really have a really good prayer. I'm going to go on a different walk. Amen. I'm taking a different direction. There are eight houses for sale. <laughs> simple. I gotta love God with all my heart. Yeah. But it sure isn't easy. Yeah. Turn over uh, one page back. At least it's one page in my Bible. <laughs> Philippians chapter 4. Yes. Come on, bro. In Philippians chapter 4 we read this in verse 4. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and by petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Skip down to verse 10. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. And did you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all things, all this, through Him who gives me strength. Wow. What an amazing scripture. Last week I asked the song leaders, I said, Ernesto, there's a great song, Psalm 111. It's called Rejoice. Can we sing it? He's like, bro, we, uh, we, don't, we don't know that song. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> bro, if you look at the words, it's rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. rejoice. Now you know the song. Yes. <laughs> bro, can we please sing Psalm 111? Because the Bible says we're supposed to rejoice in the Lord always. Yeah. Nessa said, well, we'll try to learn it. Look at how hard it is. <laughs> so next week, Ernesto promised we're going to sing that song. Why right, don't Ernesto, you're going to learn the song this week. <laughs> because we've got to go wherever we're going. Rejoice on the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. See, Paul said, I've learned to be content no matter what. You've got to look at your heart and say, do you love the God with all of your heart? If you do, you're not on this emotional roller coaster ride. See, when we're on this emotional roller coaster ride, you know what it is? I love God, I don't love God. I love God, I don't love God. I love God, I don't love God. And we've got to understand, and do you know anybody like that? Don't look at anybody else. Because we all have those situations. You may not like the Rams, you may not need a house, but you may want the latest iPhone. Oh, I want the latest iPhone. I want the latest iPhone, I don't want You know? Maybe some of you aren't married, and maybe you're thinking, I sure would be happier if I was married. If I could meet Mr. Wright or Mrs. Wrong. The idea is the fact is that those are all things that pull in our hearts, yeah. our emotions, our feeling and belonging to a place. Yeah. And God says to have an indestructible life, you've got to have an indestructible heart. Yeah. Wow. You've got to ask yourself, is there anything in the world you would trade for wow. your relationship with wow. God? Wow. Is there anything pulling on your heart? Say, if I had this, if I could just win the lottery, then I'd be happy. Guess what? That is what's pulling on your heart. Wow. Yeah. And you've got to pray wow. to surrender. See, Paul understood to be content, whether he had plenty or not, was to cling to Jesus. Come on. And we've got to cling to Jesus. Jesus had an indestructible heart. He was about one thing, loving God. Yeah. He loved God with all of his heart. And we've got to do the same, amen? Amen. amen. See, Good, we have relationships 
or possessions or whatever, our status in life. The older I get, the more I want people to respect me and to, 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 to you know, honor me, if you will. And, and yet, that doesn't always happen. You guys are awesome. I feel completely loved by the church. Come on, bro. Yeah. And, and so grateful for that. And yet, if that's what I get my joy and my emotional Come satisfaction on. from, then I'm missing it. Wow. I love my wife and I love my sons. But if that's what I get my emotional satisfaction wow. from, then guess what? Yeah. I'm blown. Yeah. I have a destructible heart because wow. there are times they're not so nice to me. Wow. And it's not because they don't like me or anything like that. It's just they're human. Yeah. Yeah. And we're just not nice to everybody all the time, are we? Yeah. We can be selfish. Yeah. So I'm grateful for the, the gifts that God's given me in my family and, and, the, and the friends around me and stuff like awesome. that. I'm grateful to have Hector and Taylor move into our house with yes. us and be our roommates and be our family as well. And, but if that's what I get my happiness from, mm. my joy from, my contentedness from, mm. guess what? They're going to fail me. Wow. wow. Yeah. You know, we've got to decide to have an indestructible heart. Amen? Yes. Yes. Turn back to Matthew chapter 22. I meant to tell you earlier, mark that spot. We're going to go back there a couple times. Come on, bro. And my second point, you've got to have an indestructible soul. Yeah, come on, bro. In Matthew 22, we read this in verse 37. Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. You know, how do we, we love God, we realize, we recognize, okay, with my heart is with my emotions, but what does it mean to love God with all your soul? You know, when I say the word soul, it's kind of an ambiguous word in that we don't really know how to define it, right? Like I even was like, well, how do I define soul and how do I love God with all my soul? Well, you're in luck because I, I found some answers. Oh, See, we've got to understand that our soul is our innermost being of basic life, our basic life instinct. Mm. Our soul, here's, here's something that's really cool that I hadn't really thought about, is that everything else about us one day is going to die. Mm -hmm. wow. Some of you, your hair might die like mine did. Oh, yeah, bro. Oh. 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 Some of you, your skinniness might die like mine did all the time. Oh. 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 Right? But our bodies are one day going to die. Yes. <laughs> Our position in life, our marriages, our relationships, our, our children, someday all those things are going away because we're going to die. It's a fact, 100% of human beings die. Yes. Okay? That's a fact. But there's one part of you that is immortal. Wow. Have you guys ever wanted to be immortal? To live forever? You know what's cool? Your soul is immortal. It is going to live forever forever. Wow. And you've got to decide where wow. is it going to wow. live forever. Woo. Turn over to a, a book in the Old Testament. Again, mark this place because we'll come back. Job. The book of Job. Oh, come on, Job. It was named after our brother Job Sterling in the back. Woo. <laughs> come on, Job. Come on, Job. I mean, you got to be pretty crank and have a Bible named after you. Bible, yeah. book of the Bible named after you. I've looked for the book of J all my life. I can't find it. But the book of Job is there. Right? That's pretty awesome. I'm just grateful that Job lets me hang out with him once in a while. In Job chapter 21. The book of Job chapter 21. We read this scripture in verse 22. It says, Can anyone teach knowledge to God? Since he judges even the highest, one person dies in full vigor, completely secure and at ease, well nourished in body, bones rich with marrow. Another dies in bitterness of soul, wow. never having enjoyed anything good. Side by side they lay in the dust, and worms cover them both. Wow. See, it really doesn't matter how you live because you're going to die. And the fact is, is that how you live is going to determine where your soul goes when you do die. Will you die in bitterness of soul, having never enjoyed anything good, the goodness of God? Or are you going to die well nourished, full of health and vitality in your soul? Right. See, we've got to decide today how we're going to live our lives. 
And how we're going to keep an indestructible soul. Come on, bro. Because our soul one day is either going to live in heaven, in happiness, in joy, in bliss, or it's going to live in hell, in torment, pain, and bitterness. Because of the decisions we make today. See, I think we've got to decide and realize that God has a great plan for us. Yeah. Yeah. But I've got to all the time wrestle yeah. to make sure that my soul ends up with God wow. in right. heaven. Yeah. Turn a few chapters over to Job chapter 33. Wow. Come on, bro. Come on, Job chapter 33. If you don't think this is important, look at the, the person that wrote Job 33, God, tells us here. Now, the book of Job was written a long, long time ago. Yep, yep. It's a story about a guy who loved God, worshiped God, praises God, praised God all the time, prays for his children, and God blessed him. But then Satan comes along, and he says, let me also try to destroy this guy, Job. And so God says, okay, you can do what you can, but you know, put some limits on it. You can't kill him. And Job loses everything. His kids, his family, his wealth, everything is taken from him. His health, everything. And so he's sitting there and he's praying and he's trying to figure out why. Have you ever had that question? Why is this happening? That's what the book of Job is about. Him wrestling with why, God. I don't understand. Help me to understand. And one of the things he says early on is that God doesn't speak to men because we're just mortal. He doesn't speak to us. He doesn't tell us his plans. He doesn't tell us why those things are going on, which is somewhat true. And yet, we've got to understand that God does speak to us all the time. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. In Job chapter 33, we'll pick up in verse 12, a guy comes along. He's a young guy. So imagine me sitting there in destitute and Geo comes along. And Geo says, I want to share a few things of wisdom that I've garnered through my many years of life. <laughs> And so he begins to speak, and he says this in verse 12. But I tell you in this, you are not right, for God is greater than any mortal. Why do you complain to him that he responds to no one's words? For God does speak, now one way, now another. Though no one perceives it, in a dream, in a vision of the night when deep sleep falls on people as they slumber in their beds, he may speak in their ears and terrify them with warnings to turn them from wrongdoing and keep them from pride. To preserve their soul from the pit, their lives from perishing by the sword. Or someone may be chastened on a bed of pain with constant distress in their bones so that their body finds food repulsive and their soul loathes the choicest meal. Wow. Their flesh wastes away to nothing and their bones once hidden now stick out. Their soul draw near to the pit, and their life to the messengers of death. Yet, if there's an angel at their side, a messenger, one out of a thousand, sent to tell them how to be upright, and he is gracious to that person and says to God, Spare them from going down to the pit. I found a ransom for them. Let their flesh be renewed like a child's. Let them be restored as in the days of their youth. Then that person can pray to God and find favor with them. They will see God's face and shout for joy. He will restore them to their full well-being. And they will go to others and say, I have sinned and have perverted what is right, but I did not get what I deserved. Wow. Wow. God has delivered my soul. From going down to the pit. Come on. Come on. And I shall live to enjoy the light of life. God does all these things to a person. Twice. Even three times. To turn them back from the pit. That the light of life may shine on them. You think God doesn't care where your soul goes? He absolutely does. And because he cares, he speaks to us time and time and time again. Do we have an angel or someone on our side that's willing to speak up on our behalf? Absolutely. Jesus says he's sitting in heaven right now at the right hand of God and say, spare this person because I love them and they're with me. See, God cares about where our soul is and where he goes, where it goes. Do we? Wow. Do we? So I think sometimes in our life, like we need to pray a lot, right? Yeah. Every day we should be praying. But sometimes our prayers need to be the deep, sincere, heartfelt, from the bottom of my toes, all the way up type of prayers. 
that says, God, I want my soul to be with you in heaven one day. You know, the story has particular uh, meaning to me, this scripture. When I was a young disciple, uh, I had found a sister in the church and I started dating her. Her name was Lisa. She was a great sister in the church. And we've been dating for about eight months. And I got to the point where I was thinking, well, maybe she's the one that I'm supposed to marry. I really began to pray about that and, and really ask God, God, what do you think? One night, I had a very, very powerful dream. And in the dream, it was our wedding day. And Lisa and I came forward as if to be married. And while we were standing there, you know, everybody's happy and stuff like that. But all of a sudden, everybody in the, out there, all the brothers and sisters in the church were like, no, 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 no. She's not the one. And they came and they took her away and sat her down. Then they brought another sister who I couldn't see who it was, and they put her next to me and said, she's the one wow. you're supposed to marry. I woke up crying and weeping from this dream. It's probably one of the most powerful dreams I've ever had in my life. I was like, holy mackerel. And I woke up early. I didn't need an alarm clock that day. <laughs> I was like, man, I've got to pray. So I went and prayed, and I walked for hours. And I came home. I was like, man, okay, now I need to read my Bible. I need to gather myself and get my strength. And I was reading through the Bible in a year. And you know where I was that day? In Job chapter 33. Wow. I read verse 12. He says, but I tell you, you're not right in this. For God is greater than any mortal man. Why do you complain to him that he responds to no one's words? For God does speak. Yeah. Now one way, now another. Preach, bro. Though no one perceives it, in a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls on people as they slumber in their beds, he may speak in their ears and terrify them with warnings to turn them from wrongdoing. Wow. And keep them from pride. To preserve their soul from the pit. Their lives from perishing by the sword. Wow. I read this scripture and I was like, whoa. That's crazy. <laughs> and that's definitely God talking to me right now. Yeah. Was there anything wrong with Lisa? No. She's still a sister in the church in Portland. She's married. I was in her wedding actually. I was one of the groomsmen in their wedding. Wow. She married one of my friends. And I'm so grateful that they stayed faithful. Yeah. But at the time, God was speaking to me. Yeah. He's saying, I'm trying to help you change your life. Wow. Yes. And you need to have a soul talk with me right now. Yes. Nice. And I'm so grateful. I called up some of the brothers. What do you guys think? And they're like, actually, bro, we're going to tell you, you shouldn't marry Lisa. Oh, oh, wow. oh really? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> She's not the right one for you. you know? I think about my life today. Come on, bro. I'm so grateful for Angie. She's the perfect woman for now. Because she's the one God picked out for me. She's the one that said, God said, if you marry her, she's going to help your soul make it to me in heaven. And you're going to help hers. I'm so grateful for Nathan and for Alonso and my boys and, and, and having them. I'd probably not have Nathan Alonso, I'd have some version of them maybe if I would have married Lisa and had kids and stuff like that. But I wouldn't have been here. You know? She wasn't the one that would go on the adventure with me that God has taken me on. You know? And it's not easy. It's definitely not easy. And yet, I had to make a soul decision back then. Wow. And to really pray and to surrender to what, where God was taking wow. me. And now you're stuck with me, sorry. <laughs> How do we love God with all of our soul? We go like Jesus did. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 38, you guys know the story. He's about to be killed, and what does he do? He goes to the garden of Gethsemane and he says, My soul is overwhelmed to the point of death. He prayed. Not only just for five minutes or ten minutes or for his 30-minute quiet time, but he prayed. From the roots of his being to the top of his head, he prayed and poured out every single thing he was yes. wow. so that he could do God's will and yes. preserve his soul. He had an indestructible soul because he was willing to do that. How about you? When was the last time 
you had one of those type of prayers that just you just needed to give up everything you have to God. Mm -hmm. I want to encourage you. I, I've told this to other people, and I've probably preached it before as well. You've got to have a place that is your place where you go meet God. Yeah. There's a park kind of near my house that I don't go to all the time. Like I said, I normally walk around and look at all the houses for sale. But there's a place that I go to when I really need to be close with God. Yes. Yeah. And a lot of times it's a park and there's people with their dogs and run around and stuff like that. But I can go down amongst the trees and the river and just sit and pray and let God speak to my soul. See, we don't need to do that all the time. But there are times in your life, and you know when they're up, yeah. this yeah. is a soul decision. Yeah. Yep. Right. Am I going to stay faithful? Wow. Or am I going to turn this way? <clears throat> You've gone after the advice and the input, but you know, I need to sit here and pray nice. until my soul is surrendered. Come on, bro. Jesus had to do it for multiple hours in the Garden of Gethsemane. But in the end, he got up, I'm ready. Because he had made a decision. To love God with an indestructible soul. Amen. 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 Turn back to Matthew chapter 22. <laughs> Matthew chapter 22, our third point. Oh, baby. Come on. In Matthew chapter 22, verse 37, it says, Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. The third point is an indestructible mind. You know, really it is our mind that we have to change first all the time. Yes. Yes. It's maybe the last in the list, but you've got to get your mind wrapped around loving God with all my soul. You've got to get your mind wrapped around loving God with all my emotions and my yeah. heart, right? It's our minds that we have to change first a lot of times. You don't have to turn there, but in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it says, In view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. It says, Renew your mind. So you can test and see how God's will is good, pleasing, and perfect. If you don't change your mind, God's will is not going to be good, pleasing, and perfect. Yeah. Wow. It won't. Wow. Now, His will is good, pleasing, and perfect, right, but right. you just won't see it. Right. Because you haven't renewed your mind. Turn over to Luke chapter 4. So how did Jesus renew His mind? I'm glad you asked me that question. Come on, bro. You guys ask really good questions. Yeah, bro. In Luke chapter 4, we're going to read this starting in verse 1. <clears throat> Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man should not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor it, uh, that has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will be all yours. Wow. Jesus answered, Will there be a house with a pool? <laughs> oh, wait. No. Oh, no. <laughs> Found the book of J. Yes. <laughs> Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he had left him until an opportune time. So how did Jesus have an indestructible mind? It is written. It is written. He knew his scriptures. You know, if you ever faced a temptation and answered, it is written. I would say most of us know is the answer. Because we don't take the time to know the scriptures. Uh, wow. We think having a 30 minute time in the Bible in the morning is enough. Oh, no. Do you think Satan only tempts you for 30 minutes a day? Uh, I, well, maybe you, but me, no. He comes after me all day, every day. Look at this house. Look at this house. Oh, you should be making more money. Your friend sold something. Why don't you sell something? Because God's not with you. 
temptation after temptation after temptation. Yeah. And I got to be able to answer, it is written yeah. that God will take care of me. Well, Do you know who knows the scriptures really well? Satan. Satan. If you look at the scriptures, he's quoting scriptures to Jesus. Yeah. Hey, Jesus, follow this scripture. And so we've got to become students of the Bible. Yeah. To know the scriptures inside and out. The Old Testament and the New Testament. Yeah. Today I'm preaching a lesson from a quiet time. From time spent in the scriptures. Yeah. Could you do that? Yeah. Wow. Have you had quiet times this last week where, man, I need to share this with somebody. Oh. I think we get so caught up in talking about everything else. We don't talk about the scriptures. I appreciate wow. Olympia. Come on, Olympia. And one of the things I was thinking about is, when was the last time someone came up to me and shared, hey, man, I read this in my quiet time, and it was really good. And so I preached that at, at early communion for the people over there and stuff like that, and I was going to talk about it here. Today, Olympia came up to me. She goes, oh, I just had a great quiet time. I read this scripture. And she started sharing. I'm like, hey, man, that's yes. awesome. That's you know? Like, that's what we've got to share. Not like, oh, I found this great dress on sale. You should come see it. You know, hey, do you want to trade football players on our fantasy oh, football? Yeah. Oh, like, oh, 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 oh. yeah, Tyler. Come for you, Jim. We'd spend hours talking about trivial, yeah. trivial things that don't matter. Mm. But we can't even spend two minutes talking about what you read in the yeah, Bible. Come on, bro. Wow. Real. What scriptures you're learning. Man, I've been studying this for my quiet times. I've been studying the book of Hebrews for my quiet times for about two weeks now. I'm in chapter 7. I'm not making it very far. You may be saying, you're kind of slacking, bro. You should be done with the book by now. No, I'm digging deep in the scriptures. Every day is like, whoa, this is cool. Oh, this is awesome. But to my shame, I think, wow, who, was, who have I been sharing that with? Nobody. Jesus shared it all the time. Okay, get your pens ready. You're going to write down these verses, and you can come back and look at them later. All of these take place just in the book of Luke. So you can write Luke, and then we're going to write a whole bunch of numbers. Oh, Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 19, and also verse 23. Luke chapter 7, verse 27. Luke chapter 8, verse 10. Luke chapter 13, verse 34 through 35. Luke chapter 18, verse 18 through 20. Luke chapter 19, verse 46. Luke chapter 20, verse 17 and 37 and 42 through 43. Luke chapter 22, verse 37. Luke chapter 23, verse 28 through 30. And even verse 46. In Luke chapter 23, verse 46, Jesus is hanging on a cross and he's about to die. You know what his last words are? quoted some Old Testament scripture. You're going to have to look it up. I'm not going to show it to you. <laughs> His very last words on the cross was the scripture. Wow. When you die, what are your last words going to be? Wow. Will it be the scriptures? Because that's what's on your heart and that's what's on your mind. Because we have an indestructible mind. Turn over to Luke chapter 24. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Jesus comes back in verse 45. Let's see what he does. In Luke chapter 24, verse 45. It says that he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead and on the third day and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in His name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Wow. You are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. He gives them two gifts at the end of His life. One, the power to understand the Scriptures. He opened up their minds so they could have an indestructible mind. If you think about who the apostles were, they were fishermen. They were tax collectors. They were sinners. There was no great people among them. But how do they change the world so that even today we preach about Jesus? 
even today, thousands of miles from where they were, thousands of years from when they lived, we still know about Jesus because they understood the scriptures. Their mind was open to the scriptures. They had an indestructible mind because they knew one thing. Jesus is Lord. Come on. Come on. It is written that Jesus is Lord. Yeah. And that is what I'm clinging to. Come on. Yeah. And that's what they taught everybody else. For us, we've got to ask, is that the same message? Is that what we're teaching to other people? Yeah. Do we understand the scriptures? Do we spend time really digging in and studying our Bibles so that we can let it move and change our minds? Because if we don't change our minds, we won't change our hearts, and we won't change our souls. Yeah, that's true. Wow. See, we've got to have an indestructible mind. Mm. This morning, I want to encourage you that Jesus lived an indestructible life. He lived an awesome life. And one day we'll get to be in heaven with Him because of that indestructible life and because of God's grace. But the only people that will be in heaven with Him are those who also have an indestructible life. Wow. Wow. It's going to take you having an indestructible heart, not being on the emotional roller coaster up and down, but really saying, no, Jesus is Lord. Yeah. And I'm going to make sure that my heart, I'm going to pray and get my heart right be content because I'm going to cling to Jesus. Mm -hmm. What more do I need? Really in the, our lives, we think about it, we try to fill up our lives with so many things we think we need. Yeah. We only need one thing, wow. and that's to be close to Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it was really funny. On, on Friday night, our group went out. We had a party for Paulina's birthday. Ooh. Ooh. And I was sitting next to Mo's sister, Mariah. And we were just talking, and she's like, oh, yeah, you know, she's, a, what, 11 or 12, 11. I think it's 11. And she doesn't quite have a cell phone yet. I said, that's no worries. I didn't have a cell phone until I was 32. <laughs> I'm okay. Well, maybe not, but, you know, I'm, I'm here at least. <laughs> See, we don't Come need on, anything bro. else. But our heart tries to constantly tell us, you do. You would be happier if you owned a house. You'd be happier if you made more money. You'd be happier if you were married. Those are all lies from Satan. Yeah. He's trying to destroy your heart. Don't listen to him. Yes. Come on. We need to have an indestructible soul. Our soul is the only immortal part of who we are. It is going to live forever. So decide whether it's going to live in heaven, in happiness, or in hell, in bitterness. Yeah. Make those decisions. Find your Garden of Gethsemane. This week, if you don't have that place, find that Garden of Gethsemane and make it this is my place. Everywhere I've lived, I've found a place because I know I need it. Because I know wherever I live, there are going to be times where I need to make sure that my soul is centered and close to God. Mm -hmm. Not only do we have to have an indestructible heart and an in indestructible soul, but we have to have an indestructible mind. What efforts are you making to memorize the scriptures, to make reading and studying your Bible your life's ambition, not just something you do? I'm so proud of some of the brothers and sisters in the different churches we've been in. I've had brothers memorize a whole book of the Bible. Yeah. I was like, wow. And then preach it yeah. from memory. Guess what? That's what they used to do during these times. Yeah. Right? It's not like they all had Bibles. not like they had half-price half books and went down to half-price <laughs> books and bought themselves a cheap little Bible. No. They had triple-price books. Yes. And none of them could afford it. Cool. Yes. Very few. But they still memorized the Scriptures. <laughs> because Jesus taught them. It is written. Mm -hmm. You know, I pray and I hope that you decide to make the mind, your minds, your hearts, your souls indestructible. Yeah. Join me in join Jesus in having an indestructible life. Thank you and God bless. Oh.